making sense. now to visit the wonderful world of the great outdoors with the Southern Sportsman, Frank White. Brought to you in part by House Autry, proven cornmeal and flour products. By the Southern Sportsman Game and Seafood Restaurant, the best food from field and ocean. And by Long Haul Jeans, the most comfortable jeans you will ever wear. Today we will return to Saxis for waterfowl hunting and cook mixed goose bag in the kitchen. I'll uh, show you in a minute why we call it mixed goose bag, but uh, I've got a nice fillet off of the breast of a wild goose that I have taken out of the field. Now the recipe when he shows you is going to call for two of these. I'm only going to cook one here or in the interest of time and everything else. Actually, one breast fillet is enough for two people. Uh, two breast fillets would make a meal for four. And wild goose is dark meat, of course, and so we're going to cook it accordingly. Now, the reason we call it a goose bag is because I have a shaker bag over here with seasoned flour in it. Our sponsor's flour, of course, and seasoned flour means that there's just been salt and pepper added to it or whatever you care to add to it. Sometimes I add an herb, a uh, special herb, or maybe some paprika or cumin or something of the sort. But actually, all I have in here now is uh, salt and pepper. And over in the frying pan is a mix of half butter and half oil. And there's about uh, two tablespoons of each. So what I'm going to do at this point is uh, put this into the frying pan and turn the heat up just a little bit because my frying pan is just a little bit cool. But I'm going to brown this on both sides. And then I'll come back and show you why we call it a mixed goose bag. And all of that is coming up in just a minute after these very important messages. Hello, I'm Camille Bradford. St. Joseph's Catholic Church here in Columbia is presenting a special Lenten series on death and dying and Chris Myers is here to tell us more about it. Chris, this is a rather unusual subject to be discussing in a series. Uh, what all is it going to involve? Well, we've got um, health care professionals from the Columbia community, from, uh, from universities, from hospitals, coming in to give a series of programs um, centered around death and dying. The um, theme was chosen not only because of its obvious need, we're all going to die, uh, we're, we're faced with it daily, um, and it's, it's great to have some preparation for it. But it also ties into the theme of the Passion and the Death of Christ. Our Lent, Lenten series prepares us for the uh, resurrection of Christ at Easter. Our series of programs talks about death and dying, and our last program is wellness. So it, 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 it's a good theme to use during Lent. Is the program uh, possibly designed for people who have serious illness in the family, maybe uh, facing a terminal situation, is designed to help them? Both those and, and all of us who um, have parents who are still with us that we're going to have to face their death sometime, and, and um, well, just anyone. You never know when you're going to be faced with the, with the question of what to do. In our closing moments, tell us exactly where the program is being offered and when, and how you can find out more about it. It's uh, being held at St. Joseph's Catholic Church on 3600 Divine Street in Columbia. Uh, in Camler Hall, we will have dinner and the programs following our masses. And if you want any more information, you can call uh, Ron Evans at St. Joseph's, and that number is 254-7646. Thank you for being with
All righty, my uh, filet is brown on one side, and I've just turned it. We've only gone a couple of minutes there, and so it needs to go about another minute brown. I'm not cooking it all the way through uh, done. I'm going to cook it, finish cooking it a little bit later. Uh, normally, I would, if I was going to fry it on the top of the stove all the way through, I'd cook it about three or four minutes on one side and then turn it and cook it on the other side until the juice started to come through, and at that point, it would be medium rare. You should cook wild game. Uh, dark meat wild game such as uh, duck, goose, and venison, uh, dove, meat like that should be cooked like you would beef. If you like it medium rare, that's the way you should cook this. If you like it rare, then you should cook it rare. And uh, that applies to a goose breast just as much as it does to a steak from a deer. <clears throat> now, this is getting just about right. And as I say, I will tell you why we call it a mixed bag. First, I need to turn the heat down just a little bit. And we call it a mixed bag because we use two different kinds of wine. I've got a bottle of dry white wine and a bottle of dry red wine. And we just pour enough of the wine in to just about uh, cover the bottom of the frying pan, just generously in there, cover it up, and let it steam, uh, just simmer there for about 15 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes, depending on, depending on how big the filet is. If this was a duck breast, I'd go about 12 minutes. It's a goose breast. It's about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half thick, so I would let it go. Uh, I will let it go about 15 minutes. <clears throat> and I remind those of you who do not imbibe that the alcohol in the wine will steam away. Uh, this is going to be about 350, 400 degrees or somewhere in that atmosphere, and alcohol boils at about 170 degrees, somewhere in that range. So uh, there won't be any alcohol in there, but we will have the flavor. It's a very simple and easy recipe, and you can do it with duck breast. I guess you could do it with a venison steak, although I've never cooked a venison steak that way. Uh, a great many of the things that we do here on the program uh, come as a result of people that contact us. Uh, they run across something that they think that we might enjoy, and they'll give us a call or write us a letter and say, I think you ought to try this. And uh, every so often, a certain percentage of those, we really hit pay dirt. I hit pay dirt about six months ago when Wilson Glenn Jr. at Saxis, Virginia, up on the eastern shore of Virginia, called me and he said, I've been watching the show for some time now, and when you go waterfowl hunting up in this part of the country, you always end up in Maryland, and I've never have seen you do anything on the Virginia eastern shore. And I said, well, Mr. Glenn, I didn't know you had that much up there. And he says, well, among other things, we've got lots and lots of ducks, and I'd like to invite you up. So I looked at my calendar, and the next time I was up there during the hunting season, I went by. Now, that trip, that first trip that I went on, was right before Christmas, and the weather was entirely different. In fact, I'm going to show you a little of that today, and then I'm going to show you what's almost like going to another planet. I've been back up there twice since, but this is that first trip, and we had ducks. I declare I've never seen, and the reaction we got from this show, uh, there were ducks just flying all over the place this particular day. Warm weather. It was a rainy day in December, and the wind was blowing, which are ideal conditions uh, for waterfowl hunting. This is Chesapeake Bay, the eastern shore area of Virginia, not far from the Maryland line. In fact, here we're only about three or four miles from the Maryland line where it crosses the bay itself. Out near Tangier Island, if you guys know where that is, this is Wilson Glenn Sr., and you'll see Wilson Glenn Jr. in just a minute, but uh, he's the one that called me and invited me up. And as I say, as a consequence of this program, just being there to film it, and the reaction we got from it, I determined that the first opportunity I would get, I would go back to Saxis. And I have been back twice since, much later in the season. This is Wilson Glenn Sr. And this is his son, Wilson Glenn Jr. And they both have become good friends of mine. They're both good sportsmen. I enjoy hunting with them very much. And Wilson Jr. told me that the reaction he got from seeing this on the program that we showed you a couple of months ago has, has really been outstanding. Now, there's, there's every kind of duck here. There's scalp, there's redheads, canvasbacks, buffleheads, all sorts of mostly diving ducks because we're out here in, in, in the ocean. We're out where the divers are. I mean, we're out in big water. We're not in the Atlantic Ocean, but we're in Chesapeake Bay, and sometimes that gets pretty close to being an ocean. But absolutely marvelous gunning. I just haven't seen one. That one just kind of cartwheeled through the water. They look like one of those airplanes that they shot down in World War II. Now's the visit to the other planet. 
This is right at the tail end of the season. And you remember that cold spell we had in January, about the middle of January? Well, this is why duck hunters are crazy. We're going today with W.A. Williams, who is a guide, and Wilson has taken us in his boat. And a friend of mine drove up with me from Greenville, Ted Johnston. He's the guy wrapped up in the brown camouflage stuff that looks like an Eskimo. This ice varied from two to three inches in thick. And this is a marvelous boat. You'll get a little better look at it a little later on. It's a fiberglass boat. <clears throat> we were breaking ice, as you see here, just driving up on these big sheets of ice, and it was cracking and giving away under us. And then we'd move on. It took an hour to go three miles to where we could find open water. This uh, whole bay area, right up to the marina, to the ramp, had frozen in. And we're looking for a lead, an open area, so we can put out decoys. Uh, uh, no duck in his right mind is going to come in and land on this. He'd break his neck. So we got to get out to where he's got free open water. And where you have free open water, that's where they go, because that's where they can land. That's Ted Johnston on the right. In the bundlesome camouflage, all the down jackets and waders and everything else. And there's another close-up of the ice. Uh, it's cold out here, friends and neighbors, you can believe. If you take your gloves off or if you leave your nose hanging out in it too long, it's painful. It really does hurt to be out there in this wind. It was blowing about 25 knots. The temperature was about 20 degrees. And Chesapeake Bay was frozen. And it has to be rather cold to freeze salt water anyway. The guys are putting out decoys here. In an open place like this, when we went in, this place had a lot of ducks in it. They were sitting in there resting. And they fly off and they fly around and look for another place. In a little bit, they come back. And when they do, they have a rude shock. They fly into a shot string of number five magnum shot into the face. Those two, I on the wrong ducks there. Uh, Ted shot one behind, and I thought he was going to shoot one of the front ones, and I stayed on them. He got a duck, but I didn't get it on film, but this will give you an idea of what it was like out there. Frozen bay and the wind blowing 25 knots. This is W.A. Williams who lives at Saxis. He lives on Saxis Island. There's a little village of Saxis. Uh, I don't know exactly how many, but I'd say four or 500 people. But I have found this is some of the finest gunning that I have run across in many, many years. And the reason is it hadn't been found yet. It may get found now. I show you film like this with mixed emotions because the big hordes of waterfowl hunters that go to Delaware and Maryland and other places up there on the Delmarva Peninsula are gonna to start to see this. And I know the guys are really upset about uh, that hunt up there regularly. I know they're gonna be really upset about seeing this because we're going to be getting more people up there, but it's a great place to go. And, of course, there are guides available up there. Wilson guides during the wintertime. He's in the seafood business. He and his father uh, have a big company that processes and sells uh, soft-shell crabs. This is a black duck. We finally got our limit and just quit shooting. Now, black duck is among the most wary birds in the world. A black duck particularly on the eastern shore, is considered a trophy. Uh, there said to be no duck smarter than a black duck. Look how tame this one was. He had to have open water. Here comes another one, and we're, I'm standing up in the blind filming this bird, and he's here in the camera, and he's looking over there, and he's a little nervous and going off, but I've never seen black ducks come in like this, just with no caution whatsoever. And, of course, they were coming to that open water. They had to have a place to come in. And Ted and I were just sitting there and shaking our heads in amazement when these black ducks would come in. And I was just filming them, taking their picture, and letting them go on off. And as the sun set, it was a beautiful, beautiful sunset, and it was very red, very bright, uh, when that sun went down, very clear, and it looked like it should have been warm, but it was not. That ice that we were plowing through there, uh, it, was, it was really a cold day. Uh, that's duck hunting up there. Now, they don't have the geese that they have in Delaware and Maryland, but they do have some geese. And we went back after the end of the duck season, but before the goose season ended, and went goose hunting. And I'm going to take you on that trip in just a minute after these very important messages.
One of our most popular dishes at the Southern Sportsman is the sweet and sour duck, a special recipe. The same goes for our frog legs. We cook them different. And Frank's fried shrimp, marinated in cognac, fried in a beer batter, served with a special sauce. Wow, you could say that about all 25 of our recipes on the Southern Sportsman menu. Our most frequent complaint is that we don't charge enough. Well, we put out the best game in seafood we can at the Southern Sportsman at a fair profit. If you don't think you've paid enough, fine. Give the rest to your favorite charity with our compliments. Here in the South, we enjoy hush puppies, especially with fish. Well, the folks at House Autry right here in the South have developed a family of hush puppy mixes that make it real easy to prepare wonderful tasting hush puppies. All you do is add water to the mix and spoon them into the deep fat fryer. Easy. There are mixes to satisfy a variety of tastes. If you can't find House Autry hush puppy mix on your grocery shelf, ask for it. Hush puppies from the folks of House Autry, Newton Grove, North Carolina. Sneaky Snake, the live-action salt flavor worm, is the hottest bass-busting lure on the market. The folks at Seeker Lure make you this fantastic get acquainted offer. We'll send you an assortment of 60 Sneaky Snakes and 140 tournament-tested worms and 100 Red Hot Crappy Jigs and 40 Frog Traders and 20 of the newest in lures, the Shining Shad, for the unbelievable low price of $23.95. That's a $60 value for $23.95. Call toll-free or send your check or money order to Sneaky Snake, Post Office Box 710, Mountain Home, North Carolina, 28758. This is my partner here at the Southern Sportsman Restaurant, Bobby Carraway. What you eating? Uh, make a sharp steak. How about you? Fresh fried eel. Well, you could have had frog legs. Well, you could have had fish imperial. Well, you could have had quail with grits and gravy. And you could have had sweet and sour duck. And you could have had merry old soul. Rabbit supreme. Seafood platter. Stuffed rainbow trout. Ribeye. Fried oysters. Spicy boiled trout. Oyster pie. Fried the menu at the Southern Devil Sportsman fried. is fried worth fried arguing fried about. Fried. Sharp steak. You already said that. Well, the ice stayed up there uh, for quite some time. Uh, I haven't been up there in the last few days. It may still be up there. But it really was. It was It was an absolutely one of those almost, it was like going to the North Pole. It was Arctic uh, kind of air that was coming in on us there. And, of course, that is great for waterfowl hunting. That's what duck hunters are after. It seems sort of uh, a shame sometimes the way we set our seasons. For instance, this year down in North Carolina, it snowed the day after duck season ended. We didn't have any snow down there at all. Now, of course, up further north we did, up in Maryland and Delaware and uh, the northern part of Virginia. We had good snows this year, but down in North Carolina, our snow didn't come until after the birds were no longer fair game, after the season had closed. Well, uh, sometimes duck hunters get upset about that, and they try to get the season set a little bit later, but that doesn't always work. Of course, sometimes we look out and we have snow and sleet and ice and things like that earlier in the season. Uh, another waterfowl, duck is my favorite, and then after duck comes uh, the Canada goose, and I like to go to Maryland, and I went this year to Delaware and had a marvelous hunt. I never had thought too much about geese being down on the eastern shore of Virginia, but right in there in the Saxis area, there's a small population, not the hundreds of thousands that are further north, but about 12,000 or maybe 14,000 Canada geese roost and feed during the winter right there just offshore from Saxis. They fly inland to the fields to eat, and at night they go back into the bay and roost. Well, when it's frozen, they, go, they fly back and land on the ice, and they just stand on the ice. I know they get cold feet, and I can see them out there picking up one foot and then another standing on that ice all night, but that's where they roost. So I'm going to take you back there now. We're going back with W.A., and Wilson Jr. and Ted. Ted and I drove back a few days after that film that you just saw to try for the geese. And I don't know why we go so early uh, when it's not necessary. Now, most of the time, particularly duck hunting, you need to go early in the morning. But uh, the geese in this particular area and this time of winter, they like people. They like to sleep a little late, and it's about 8.30 or 9 o'clock before they really get out and start coming. But we go at daylight. Now this is the major part of the flock at Saxis. And it was in this huge field that you see. We had permission to hunt here. This is a private field. And we didn't want to shoot on a flock this size. There are 10,000 birds. You're looking at 10,000 Canada geese. And there they are. This is one of the most awesome sights in nature. It's just incredible to see this many birds. And we went out and put the decoys out 
on our side of the field, and of course the activity and everything disturbed the geese, and some of them near us got up first, and the others just said, well, if they're going to leave, we'll all go. So that whole field arose. It really is one of the most amazing sights that I've ever seen in my life, 10,000 geese just wheeling around in the air overhead. Really one of, one of nature's great gifts to be able to see something like this. And this and the ducks that I saw up there are the reasons that I have fallen in love with Saxis Island, Virginia. It has become one of my favorite places. There they are. Well, we had to wait for them. They kind of flew around and looked and thought it over and talked it over. The noise is absolutely deafening. All these geese are talking to each other at once. I don't know how they understand or how they can hear each other because they're all yakking at once. But they left, and then they began to come back in smaller groups, and that's when you want to shoot. And particularly when there's twos and threes and fours, and especially even if they're singles. And the first bird that came over was a single, and he was about 70 yards up. I swear, this, this is a tremendous shot that Wilson made there. He raised up and shot that goose. And it had ice on its wings, I'm sure, when it hit the ground. It came from so high. But he's a good shot, and he just shrugged it off. He said, no, nothing to it. He said, I shoot him that way all the time. A lot of good eating here. Average goose will go about six or eight pounds. Once in a while, you run into a 12 or 14 pounder, something like that. But uh, the best eating size, I think, uh, the best age is about six or eight pounds, somewhere in that neighborhood. Ted folded that one. As you may have guessed, I'm shooting in slow motion here to kind of slow the birds up. Uh, actually, not full slow motion, but I'm shooting twice normal speed, so the birds that you're seeing here now are uh, flying on film half the speed that they are actually flying out there in the air. I hope you understood that. And three came over. And the guys raised up and got all three of them. Well, the limit in Virginia is four birds a man. In other words, we could have shot 16 birds, but I had the film I want. I said, listen, this is some of the finest film I've ever seen, and let's don't bother these birds anymore. They've got, there's, there's big bunches of them here. And the man that owned the land had a friend who wanted to hunt the next day, which was the last day of the season. We're right here on the tail end of the season, but not the last day. And uh, Ted had, shot all the ducks that he wanted a few days before, and he'd gotten himself a couple of geese. And I said, if you're happy, I'm happy. Let's go and leave the birds alone. So we took five birds out of the 16 limit that we were legally entitled to. And as we left, those birds were still flying. Now that farm belongs to a very fine gentleman named W.C. Shields, who lives up there at Saxis, actually near the village of Sanford. And Mr. Shields, uh, has had experiences uh, that he didn't like with some hunters. So he is very particular about whether you can hunt there or not. And if you go on the field without his permission, you are trespassing, and he will get uh, somewhat upset about it, uh, understandably. But it's a great place. He loves to watch those birds and see them out there, and he lets them come and, and stay relatively unmolested. And that was one reason I didn't want to shoot them too much, is because he does let them come in there, and they very seldom ever get shot at but he gave me the opportunity to film those, and I want to thank Mr. Shields for the opportunity of doing that. And we took five of his birds uh, and left 11 more that we could have taken if we had so desired. Uh, that is waterfowl hunting in Saxis, Virginia. The ducks and the geese up there, it's really a spectacular place. And I've got an idea when I go back next season, I'm gonna find it a little bit more crowded than I found it this past year. I'll be back here in a minute with a final word after this. I feel comfortable outdoors, especially when I'm wearing my long-haul jeans. Not only are long-haul jeans practical, they're the most comfortable jeans I've ever worn. Long-haul jeans are cut bigger in the seat and the thighs, and they're made from stretch denim, so they look good and feel good, even when I stretch, bend, or sit. And that's important, because it looks like I'm going to be sitting here quite a while. Long-haul jeans, the most comfortable jeans you'll ever wear. 
here's the sower, Michael Guido of Meta, Georgia, with a seed for the garden of your heart. A little girl asked, Dad, can you write your name with your eyes closed? I think so, he said. Great, she replied. Shut your eyes and sign my report card. While you can hide your marks from man, you can't hide your mischief from God. He sees and knows everything. He keeps a perfect record of your life. Your past, present, and future are known to him. He'll not allow hidden evil go unpunished or hidden good go unrewarded. The Bible says God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. A seed from the sower has originated from the studios of the Guido Evangelistic Association, Meta, Georgia. I thought maybe I'd go to the school library for a while. What? Studying on Saturday? Well, yeah, in a way. They're having tryouts for the girls' cheerleading team. <laughs> Big ears. Yeah, and lots of them. <laughs> I love the way they shake their pom-poms. Betty, that is all he ever thinks about. Say something to him. All right. Willis, I think I'll go with you. <laughs> Okay, first, I want to give you uh, Wilson's name um, in the town of Saxis, Virginia. We've got an address here for him. The area code is 804. You can call the operator. It's late for this season. Uh, I mean, this season is over, but he's already booking for next year. And if you're interested in going up there, he has blinds, guides, accommodations, and he's the guy you want to talk to. Please don't call me. Uh, I want to leave this thing up here long enough for you to be able to get it. It's Saxis, S-A-X-I-S. Virginia. It's over on the, on the eastern shore, up near the Maryland line, and the area code is 804. Call the information operator and ask for Saxis, Virginia, and they'll be glad to give you uh, his phone number. But if you want to do any booking for next year, this might be the time to do it, because he's already been getting some calls from the program that I did before, and uh, he's already begun to book up there. So it's a good time to get in, and in fact, I'm probably going to have to call him and uh, make myself a couple of dates up there. But the season has not been set yet. He's getting called from people, and uh, actually Virginia hasn't set the exact dates of the season, so he's just taking tentative bookings for uh, certain weeks up there. Uh, my goose is just about done, and I thought I'd show it to you here. It's going to be a little steamy, but this is what it looks like. Now, you can cook a duck breast this way. Uh, you can even cook coot or merganza or something like that, but you should marinate them overnight before you do that. But... Uh, two duck breasts or four duck breasts or however many that you want to cook, half of a duck breast, one, I'm a goose breast, one filet off of the goose breast is enough for two people. This, that chunk of meat there uh, is very red and very rich and it will serve two people. And I'm going to set it aside and I may have that for supper a little bit later on if I can fight the crew off uh, and get it. Uh, waterfowl hunting is my favorite sport. Uh, sportsmen pay for their sport uh, as much or maybe more so than any others. Now, in 1934, sportsmen asked the federal government to start a thing called a duck stamp program. And since then, $285 million has been raised uh, through the duck stamp. Three and a half million acres of refuge in this, uh, they're telling me to hold it some way, and I don't know what that means. I'm trying, okay. There you go. This is what it looks like. You buy it at the post office. Originally it cost a dollar, but now it costs seven dollars and a half. But it's gone to refuge money. Now, refuges are places where you can't hunt. And we bought three and a half million acres for birds to go to, to rest on, uh, where you can't hunt. And that's just one thing that sportsmen do. I will see you here next week. That's all the time we have. Until then, please do not litter. Do yourself a favor. Take a kid hunting. The Southern Sportsman has been brought to you in part by House Autry, proven cornmeal and flour products. The Southern Sportsman Game and Seafood Restaurant, the best food from field and ocean. And by Long Haul Jeans, the most comfortable jeans you will ever wear.